Hello, welcome to Gardner's World. Now, today is a special hour-long program from Gardner's World Live at the NEC. The show started on Wednesday and is open till Sunday night. Lots of people here today, and, and I guess lots of you will be coming along over the weekend. And what we all come here for is to get that first taste of summer. It's a summer flower show. And they get the colour and the vibrancy in the show gardens, in the floor marquee and all the stands. And as well as inspiration, you get a great chance to go shopping too. Now, I'm not here alone. I'll be joined by the whole team. Joe will be casting his expert eye over the show gardens, drawing out design tips that we can use at home. Good design is all about using what's available to you, and it doesn't have to cost the earth. This garden is made entirely from recycled materials. Rachel is taking full advantage of all the shopping opportunities here at the show. Since we gardeners are increasingly keen on encouraging wildlife into our gardens, I'll be getting some expert advice on the best products to keep the birds, bees and the bugs happy. And as ever, Carol is on the hunt for fabulous plants. I'm here in the floral marquee looking for the star performers that are going to transform your garden and announce summer's cavalcade. And I shall be talking to a nurserywoman who's displaying proudly a new plant that she found by accident. Now, I want to start by showing you this, because this is the living wall that I've been talking about on the programme for the last few weeks, asking you to bring along some plants. We've still got room to add more, although we have established quite a lot of plants on it already. And it's designed so it's got three different facets. Around the corner, we've got a face that is devoted to wildlife plants, plants that will encourage insects into the garden. This side, we've got the sunniest point, so all these plants will relish full sunshine. Of course, you can have any shape or size you wanted. That's the beauty of it. It's very, very flexible. In fact, we've chosen this height because that is the height that you can do without any planning permission. But you could make it 50 foot tall if you wanted. And this is going to be taken down and reassembled in schools. Now, around the corner here, we've got plants devoted to shade and this is what I will be especially focusing on and I'm bringing some plants from Long Meadow that I've gathered up which I know will work really well here and you can see that the foliage looks fantastic whether it's the hostas or the ferns or the astilbes you do get that sort of three-dimensional effect on the wall which I think is really dramatic so if you've got any plants at home that are spare we can find a good home for them and whatever type of aspect it likes it'll look really good on the wall. Well, here I am on the sunny side of the wall, and look at this wonderful array of plants. This is Convolvulus neorum, silvery leaves. It's soft to the touch, because each of these leaves is covered in fine hairs which protect the cuticle of the leaf from hot sun. And above it, this is rosemary, and here, each of these leaves is developed into a needle, so transpiration is really low, there's little water loss, and they just look marvellous here. Well, I've got an addition to put in here, and this is a plant called Sanguisorba. It's burnets, and it's used extensively to stop soil eroding. It's got a really thick root system that will just bind the soil together, ideal for this wall. And when it's in flower, it's just wonderful, all these catkin-like dark flowers. Now, I wonder where it's going to look best. Well, I've been given responsibility for the side of the wall, which has plants selected to attract wildlife. And how beautiful they are. This is definitely the best side. The trick, really, is to go for a variety of different flower shapes. Things like this lovely open daisy of the anthemis. That's a really good, strong sort of nectar bar, and a bee will land there and just stay there for ages. And also, you would have things like the napita with a tubular flower, and cotoneaster as well. Anyone who grows it will know that this is absolutely smothered in bees. So I have chosen this lovely Echium, Vipers Bugloss, this fabulous blue colour. I'm just going to pop them into this pocket. I think we can get three in there. There's one. 
Look out for these labels as well in the garden centre because they show that they're bee friendly. They're also good for attracting all sorts of insects. And look, got bees moving in already. It's proof that they like it. Now, just as I hope lots of you will, I wanted to bring along some plants here to add to the shady side of the living wall. So a few days ago at Longmeadow, I went round the garden gathering up plants that I thought would be ideal. I've got a job I want to do, but it's also going to give me really good stuff to take to the living wall garden as well. And that's dividing primroses. Primroses love damp shade, particularly woodland. All you have to do is just dig up a clump like that. If I just take out a block like that. Now, I could transplant the whole thing and it would do fine. But if I break it up, I'll get a whole load of plants from this. And be confident, these are strong plants. All you have to do is get your thumbs in and just rootle around and work the roots free. So you're not breaking them, you're not snapping them or cutting them, just pulling them apart. If a root does break, it doesn't matter, as long as you've got plenty left. There we are. See, that's a nice root system, good plant, and that's a, actually a little clump in itself, so that's a good one. And I think... People tend to be a bit tentative about plants, but they're usually much tougher and stronger than you think. There we go. See, that's only got one leaf, but that will grow perfectly well. Most of the early flowering herbaceous perennials will take the same treatment. Certainly pulmonaria will, and pulmonaria will be ideal for the shady side of the wall, give us some colour early on in the year. I've got plenty in here, and it does no harm to divide it every few years. Here we go. And that, you can see, in exactly the same way, will divide up. Just break it off, pop them into pieces, which I'll pop up, and replant. By the way, if your pulmonaria looks a bit mouldy, and is dusted and a little bit sad, shear the leaves back right to the ground, and then fresh new leaves will grow, they'll look fine for the rest of the summer, and it will start doing its growing and forming its flower buds in late summer. So the time to shear them back is now. These plants should thrive on the shady side of the living wall. I've also got some spare plants that I've grown from seed. Now these Ipomea, and I've got three Kabir Scandons left over, will be perfect for the sunny side of the wall. That's if it ever stops raining and we have a sunny side of the wall. Well, these are the plants that I dug up. They survive well and I'll get them into the wall, find a place for them and they'll thrive. They'll really enjoy it in here. And by the end of the weekend, this will be looking stunning with your plants too, of course. Now, one of the biggest displays in any flower show, and certainly here at Gardeners World Live, are the show gardens. And one of the things that I like about them is that there's a tradition of young designers cutting their teeth here, trying it out, experimenting. And to assess them and all the gardens, we have our own gold medal winning garden designer, Joe Swift. Oh, thanks, Monty. But having been through that process, I will never look at a show garden in the same light. The amount of work that goes into one of these is quite incredible. And they're not just for show. There's lots of ideas here, lots of design ideas and planting ideas that you really can use in your own garden. This garden's called Inside Out, and what I like about it is it could be a self-contained garden with, with rural influences such as the, the stonework and the timber work, or it could be part of a larger garden. It's got this fantastic outdoor seating area, and I love this wall here. The detail there is really good. And then to the outdoor kitchen, complete with barbecue, 
And over here, I like the use of this wall too. We've got herbs in pots sitting up there and a really good display of ornaments. And ornamentation in a garden like this is really worth thinking about. Don't always go small. The water feature over there is oversized. So small garden, think big. This garden brings the outside in by taking its inspiration from the Brecon beacons. The curves of the dry stone wall and oak decks evoke that local Welsh landscape. I really like its valley planting down the middle whilst the lawn areas are all round the outside. Now that's an interesting and original idea. I don't think I've seen it before, but it doesn't feel forced. This garden has a strong sense of place. The design has picked a planting style of drought tolerant plants amid arid rocks and gravel and really gone with it. The iris, leptospermum and salvias each have room to breathe which is nice and can be appreciated for their individual colour and form. Well, the plant quality and the execution of the garden is fantastic here. For me, I would like to have seen the boulders and the plants grouped a little bit better together, make it feel a little bit more natural. They're a bit too even, sort of spread throughout the garden. But it's top quality. Good design is all about using what's available to you and it doesn't have to cost the earth. This garden is made entirely from recycled materials. But whatever it's made of, it's still a really good little garden. Great design. It's got everything you'd want. It's got water, plenty of volume of plants in here too, and lots to eat. And I like the different levels and the feeling of privacy and security. And most importantly, somewhere to sit. Oh. That's better. June is the start of summer in the garden. And here in the Floral Marquee, the place is packed with plants that truly epitomize this time of year. And I'm on the lookout for the star performers. Surely one of the brightest stars in the June firmament has to be peonies. Just look at this. This is peonia flame. If you look at individual flowers, you can see its relationship to buttercups. It's in the Ranunculaceae family. But I'll tell you what, buttercups were never as seductive as this. Lots of peonies are truly flamboyant, but perhaps that's not your taste. If you go for the subtle and the refined, then this has to be the peony for you. It's called Immaculate, and you can see why. It's perfectly spotless. It's just so beautiful. Well, this really sets the place alight. It's aptly called Blaze. And isn't it just devastatingly beautiful, especially next to this blue anchoosa? Really brave plant combination. I think peonies make the perfect present. And it's my daughter's 30th birthday today, so I'm going to take a load of them home for her. I know they'll be happy there because the soil is heavy and rich, exactly what peonies like. Gladiolus in June. You associate gladioli with late summer, but not in this case. This is Gladiolus byzantinus, and it's doing its own thing right at this moment. As with other gladioli, it grows from corms. But in this case, you don't have to mess about lifting them and bringing them indoors in the winter because it's perfectly hardy. Where it comes from, it's a cornfield weed and it pops up everywhere. And with a bit of luck, it might pop up next to something like this beautiful Sweet William. Again, June personified. Most 
plants, it's their colour or their shape that draws you in. But in the case of roses, it's their perfume that just won't let you walk by. Look at this one, the centrepiece of the show, Souvenir du Docteur Germain. This is a, a climbing hybrid perpetual, which means it goes on flowering for ages. You can grow it as a climber, or if you've got enough room, you can leave it as a freestanding bush to do its thing. The colour is wonderful, and the texture of these roses is so velvety. But if you plant it in a very sunny place, the colour will fade. So it's best against a north wall where it flowers magnificently. When the flowers reach this stage, you almost feel like reaching in, pulling off the whole flower and plunking it into a bowl so you can enjoy that perfume. But one thing is for sure, whatever rose you choose, now is their time. Well, as Monty said, our living wall has three different aspects and this side, which is all planted with plants to attract wildlife, is really coming along and starting to fill up. And I popped these echiums in earlier, you see the bees still enjoying that. And luckily we've got lots of visitors bringing more plants. I'm really pleased to see these. <laughs> Fantastic. What have you got here? Uh, it's a white ragged robin uh, called White Robin. I originally bought it at a plant fair. I've propagated it from seeds um, at home and it is perennial, it comes up every year, but it, it will self-seed and I have a, a sort of meadow area at home so I'm trying to get it to naturalise into the, the meadow with the, with the native pink one. And do you and, see lots of, of bees and other yes, insects exactly. buzzing around it? There was a lovely bee on it a minute ago, <laughs> yes. I'm Pop sure it was back. Yes, yes, it was lovely. Yeah. Gorgeous, I think it's, I think yes, it's prettier it's, than the it's, pink one. It's very dainty, isn't it? Yes. Really nice. yeah. Where are you going to put it over I here? I thought I'd put it up there. Um, That's good, it'll give us a nice just, bit of height yeah. there at the top. And actually this, like, the Astrantia, that's really nice as well. It's got quite a, a large flower, hasn't it? Yes. What variety is yeah. that one? It's Jumble Ho and it's just so, so beautiful. It's tall and it stays the white and the green, it doesn't shared with yeah. the pink. It's a really nice one. Mm. Is, is planting for wildlife something that you really think about when I you're do. choosing plants? Yes, yes I do. And I have this in different colours, the bees and you know the other flowers and everything. They have a field day. Yeah, they love it. Well, it's gorgeous. And of course, Estranti, you could have taken, I suppose, to the shady side as well, yeah. but I think it's very good here. So where will that go, do you think? I think here. Perfect. Pop it in. So just pop it in. Yeah, that looks smashing there. Really nice. I reckon we're going to wait a minute and they'll be covered in bees. <laughs> of course, one of the greatest pleasures for a gardener is to come to a show like this and meet other people to learn. And to learn from the best is always the best experience. But one of these nursery women arrived here from quite an unusual route and we went to see her. She was a keen gardener. And then, after a bit, dared to open her garden to the public, not really expecting any more. But as a direct result, she then was offered the opportunity to start her own nursery. My first gardening memory is really sowing a packet of aquilegia seeds and just being completely blown away when they flowered. I was just hooked from that moment onwards, really. I've lived and gardened here for the last 17 years. When I first came here, it was largely rectangular lawn with narrow borders around the sides. Little by little, I ate away at the lawn to make more room for plants, and the garden just sort of gradually evolved as my gardening skills grew, really. We have a few things here that are permanent structures, like the tall ilex you can see here they're evergreen they stay all winter and they mirror the spire of the church that we're lucky to have in the distance the rest of the planting is all hardy herbaceous perennials we've got a lot of euphorbia in the garden with its lovely lime fresh green aquilegias the alliums we've got irises here irises aren't very long flowered plants but it's very nice to have a few plants in the garden that are just so sumptuously spectacular that although they don't go on for a long time they're really worth having because they knock you out when they are in flower. I've decided to try and open the garden for the National Garden Scheme. 
two very nice ladies came along to assess me to see whether I was worthy of going in the yellow book. And we are taken through the house where we are really knocked back by the sight that is in front of us, wonderful colours and just the most inventive, creative, beautiful space. One of them in particular enjoyed the garden so much that she asked me to come and do some garden work for her. I spoke to Annie about her life and her ambition was to find somewhere to grow her own plants. And we had this space that I thought might be suitable and she came up to see the space and luckily for us said she thought it would do. That is really how Daisy Roots the nursery began. And really 12 years later she is still here. Here at the nursery we have no electricity so Everything we grow here has to be hardy. Most of our plants are overwintered right out in the open, exposed to all that the elements throw at them. So really what I want to produce is a hardy plant that people take home and they can enjoy for years. This year will be our third time at Gardens World Life and we're going to be taking plants that have particularly beneficial qualities for pollinating insects. Amongst those, we've got a plant which some people might be a bit nervous of planting in the garden, but this is the variegated form of ground elder. A lot of the umbellifer plants are very good for hoverflies as well as bees, and it's a brilliant plant for lighting up a dry, shady spot. Another variegated plant that we're taking with us is this breezer, breezer media russell's form, which is commonly known as the quaking grass, because when the wind blows, the seed heads quake in the breeze. This is Dianthus carthusianorum. Good seed heads follow the stems and it's another great insect plant. Wants a nice sunny position on a reasonably well-drained soil. Although I know for definite a lot of the plants that I'm taking to garden as well, there are one or two that we'll just have to wait and see and be last minute decisions. One of those is this lovely Astrantia, which was a chance seedling that came up on the nursery a couple of years ago. Weather permitting, it will be at Gardener's World Live with us and we'll be revealing it to the world for the first time. I adore growing plants. It's my life, really. I'm the luckiest person in the world to be able to do what I love doing and manage to keep a roof over my head at the same time. Now, I see that that Astrantia, that chance seedling that you had in your nursery, is featuring prominently on your display. It is, right on the front corner here, Monty. It's, it's looking fabulous. We've had lots of interest in it. And also, you've named it. It didn't have a name before, did it? It didn't have a name. We were trying to think of a name when members of your team came round to chat to me about it yesterday morning, and one of the cameramen happened to mention he had a daughter called Celeste, and the name fitted. It's quite a star-like flower. So that is what we've named it. So, fabulous plant. The BBC can have a tiny little reflective yes, glory. But it's a beautiful name, it's a beautiful plant. Thank That's you very really much. Good. Yes, I'm very pleased. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> now, Annie's Astrantia Celeste was luck, a chance seedling that proved to be a good one. But you don't need luck to use seeds to make a garden really magnificent. And this stand, for example, has grown almost everything from seed. And that seed only amounts to 50 quid. 50 quid's worth of seed has provided all this, which doesn't just give you wonderful plants, but a really wide range to choose from. We've got perennials like the Erangium, you've got biennials like the Vabascum Polar Summer, which I love, and also that stunning annual poppy. Black peony, there is no plant that's more intense than that. And that's just to pick a few. The range of plants to be grown from seed is just enormous. Growing cacti from seed are very, very easy. They germinate between two to three weeks, but you do have to wait for 12 months before you can start transplanting them. So do many people grow cacti from seed? Most people buy the plant because they don't think they're going to live long enough to see the plant flourish. But, but that's not the case. No, once they start growing, after the 12 months in their own little pots, they just take off. If you think that cacti are a bit specialist, here's a plant that everybody's going to grow sooner or later, and that's sweet peas. 
and a sweet pea in all its glory is as lovely a flower as you could possibly grow. And of course the thing about them is not whether you grow them from seed or not, but when you sow the seed. You do it in autumn, winter or spring. And I'm doing a trial at Longmeadow looking at the various advantages of each of those timings. But I'll tell you something, if any of my plants produce flowers as lovely as these, I don't mind when I sow them. And last, but in my book anyway, certainly not least, you've got vegetables. Vegetables grown from the seed can feed you, delight you, and make a garden look beautiful. Now, I do know some people are buying plugs, but bear in mind seed is much cheaper, just as easy, and it's not too late. You don't have to sow your seed in spring. For instance, if you sow some carrots now or some French beans, they will give you a harvest later on in summer and be fantastic. And of course, the same is true of any of the salad crops. Talking of salad crops, I don't think there are any lettuce growing on our living wall. They'd be brilliant. Well, here on the sunny side of the wall, we've actually had some sun and things are beginning to settle down and perk up. The whole thing's looking really wonderful. Everything's knitting together brilliantly. But over here, there are still spaces. But people keep bringing in loads of stuff all the time. I reckon by the end of the show, this is going to be completely full. An absolute picture. We've got a courgette um, and a, a tigerella tomato and a jalapeno. Now, I think your jalapeno pepper ought to be where it's going to be at its sunniest. Sun yeah, how about in there? So it's Campanula glomerata. It is, yes. It's so hardy. Yeah. Such a good doer. And it'll have its work cut out in here, won't it? I expect so. It can ramble in I one compartment. I expect so, but it'll find its way. I'm, sure, right, it, I'm right. sure it will. Well, I'm all for a <laughs> I put money on it. <laughs> Hello. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. How What's you your name? Hugh. Mine's Carol. How do you do? <laughs> I brought you a selection. A sissy rink here. A sissy rink here. Do you know how to divide it? Oh yes, it, well it seeds very readily. Yeah. Um, we, we can pull the roots apart. Yeah, you can just pull it yes. apart as easy as, as, easy as we. I <laughs> so we can have loads of it here. Hugh, get me that on a pod note. Oh yes, this is another one. It grows <laughs> all over the place from the seeds. You this... don't even have to sow them, they just come up. It's an onopodum. Onopodum, yes. A scotch thistle. Scotch and it thistle. grows bigger than you. It grows, it can go to <laughs> 16 feet. Do you really think it's the right plant for a living I wall? I think not, no. <laughs> uh, Shall we dig a hole at the corner? <laughs> no, you've got fever for you, isn't it? Yeah. This will spread. I don't know what you're going to do with your living wall, whether it's going to be a permanent feature here no, or it's going to schools, different schools in, in the area. It'll all be dismantled and then reconstructed okay. and then the kids are going to be... <laughs> Can we try to... Yes. yes. Planting for wildlife is a really strong theme at this year's show and there's lots of very naturalistic planting schemes and actually Adam Frost's garden, which has won Best in Show, is a prime example. Now he's left the, uh, the back very quiet, I think. You get the impression that the plants aren't disturbed there very much and that means it would provide shelter and refuge for small mammals and birds, which is vital. Some beautiful trees and shrubs, among them this lovely cornice mass, which not only provide flowers, but then the berries later on for the birds. And as you walk through, there are these banks of perennials, just really beautiful to look at. And the combination here, which includes things like Geranium Johnson's Blue and the Napita, they're just buzzing with bees. Now, one of the exhibitors at the show is Kate McRae, or Wildlife Kate, to her friends. And we went to spend the day with her to see how she goes the extra mile to attract lots of creatures into her garden. Anything I can attract here into my garden, I do my best to do so through planting, habitat creation and feeding. I don't want them to just nip in, have something to eat and go. I want them to take up residence here. One of the
the first things I did in my garden area was to build a pond. To me, that's one of the most fundamental areas to start with in terms of wildlife. I built a small stream area to keep the water circulating and to offer other areas for feeding and drinking and then created an area which would be full of edge plants, uh, marginals, and then a wider area that I could plant up with a range of ferns and foliage. But a lot of it has just evolved. <laughs> Self-seeded, there's primulas, cowslips, and the marsh marigolds just take over everywhere, mainly because you can see I let them go to seed. Birds come here and, and drink. The hedgehogs I know come down here. And it's such a lovely space. I've got lots of areas that are quite shady and there I plant lots of ferns because they like living there. But also if you plant those ferns along with little log piles and bark chippings, you're creating a habitat for lots of small insects that are then going to attract other creatures such as hedgehogs. And you think an area like this with lots of hostas, usually you're struggling with slugs and fighting off them being eaten. But since I've been attracting the hedgehogs to the garden, my hostas have been untouched. I just look for stuff I like the look of and, and I also let the garden tell me what it wants. And if foxgloves, for example, they're, they're coming up absolutely everywhere at the moment, I let everything go over to seed and see where things self-seed because if, if that's the right place for them, the following year they'll reappear. Um, I've always had a bird table in the garden or two or possibly three sometimes, but I love making my own stuff as well. This is one of my DIY feeders. Um, I saw this ladle and the way it was shaped I thought it would be perfect for a bird feeder. So I just screwed it onto the fence and the birds love coming down and just perching on the end here and feeding. It's worked really well. And I like to have trays on my feeders. One it stops some wastage but also a lot of birds like sitting on the trays. A lot of the commercial trays I found were quite shallow so I started using pizza trays or baking trays, and the bullfinch particularly love those. So they've worked really well. It's like you want to get down Kate's Cafe because it's, um, it's a pretty hot place to be. <laughs> the nesting dispensers have been really popular, mainly on whisks, but you can use an old bird feeder or anything that allows you to pack a receptacle full of the kind of things that birds would like. So I've tried all different stuff, dried grass and hay, but by far the most popular is my dog's fur. So Bryn gets a good old brush every now and then and I pack it with that and the nice thing is that you can actually see them flying off with great sort of moustaches of, um, of dog fur in their beaks. For my 40th birthday my dad bought me a nest box camera kit and it completely captivated me. It showed me a side of the wildlife in my garden that I'd never seen before. And that was really the slippery slope downhill because one nest box camera kit wasn't enough, so I got a couple. So I now have 17 cameras in the garden. So wherever you look, you'll see cables, you'll see cameras. They're all over the place. So that one nest box camera kit that I got for my 40th has now turned into this. 17 cameras all wired back to my office, 24-7 live streaming on my internet, sharing it with people all over the world. And that just amazes me that people anywhere can share in the life stories of animals that are here in my patch. You can imagine with all these cameras there's always something to watch. These chicks today, it's, it's a hot day and they're getting quite big, so they're coming out of the nest cup and sitting around the edge now, and today's the first time they've done that, so I haven't seen that before. Stuff like this, you just can't see outside. So I've got a very special relationship with the animals there. When I see those chicks in my garden, I will have watched them from, well, when they were eggs, and then I'll be able to see them sitting in my garden and hopefully stay around in the coming years and possibly one of these chicks will use one of my nest boxes in the future and raise their own family. 
Kate, I thought that was absolutely fascinating. It's inspirational how much wildlife you managed to get Thank into you. your garden. Now, I know you've had a good look round at the show and done a bit of shopping. What have you found? Well, there's loads available for wildlife. First thing I found, which I absolutely love, this is a remote trail camera. So it works by having a little passive infrared sensor and it's operated by batteries. So you can set it up anywhere in your garden or anywhere in your surrounding area and you don't have to wire it back like I do with a lot of my cameras. When an animal comes past, it triggers the unit to either take a photo or a video, depending on how you've set it up. And then there's an SD card inside, just like in your digital camera. So when you retrieve it in the morning, you can just take your SD card pop it into your computer and see what was there. Just like having spring watch in your garden. It certainly is. Now this is a very snazzy bird feeder. It is indeed. Now, this is a super feeder. I love this, especially if you haven't got that much space, so you don't want lots of feeders, because the best way to attract lots of species of birds into your garden is to feed them lots of different foods, because they all like different kinds of things. This feeder is brill, because you can see it's like a twisted feeder, which means you can put three different types of food in. So what sort of birds would you expect to, to find on this and what would you use to attract them? You want to try and choose a good selection. So this seed here is um, a finch mix with a lot of niger in and the goldfinches just love niger seeds. So this, that sort of section is going to attract the goldfinches. If we turn around here, I've got black sunflower hearts. Uh, green finches, love those. Great tits and blue tits will pop in and take those. And then the gourmet food um, in my garden is sunflower hearts and that attracts all sorts of species just about everything loves that and my favorites the bullfinches they absolutely love that one this is a great feeder because you can maximize all the species that visit now what about ways of introducing habitats into the garden there's lots of commercially available little um, bug houses like this and these are great because there's lots of little holes that creatures can either overwinter in or hide away in. So these are great little habitats that you can buy and they look great in your garden as well. I think. And I noticed actually that that can be part of the design because here on Adam's garden where we're sitting yeah. there are all of these gaps here where the logs Fantastic off. habitats for creatures in here. So and what a feature, it looks fantastic. Excuse me, can I just get through? I've got to see this green wall. I've heard lots about it. Excuse me. Oh, oh wow, look at that. It's looking really good. There's so many applications for these, especially in a city where space is limited. Loads of them at Chelsea this year. These green walls are really taking off. With space to grow in the city at a premium, gardeners are turning to walls and boundaries, gardening vertically as opposed to horizontally. The most celebrated vertical gardener is French botanist Patrick Blanc. He's been clothing city architecture with green sculptural living walls around the world for many years. Living walls are opening up a whole new range of opportunities to garden in the city. They're great for biodiversity, they're fabulous pieces of living art, and edibles, herbaceous and even shrubs are being planted on the vertical to take gardening to a whole new level. Garden designer Adam Shepherd has been designing and creating living walls for the last three years. In 2011, a garden in North London with a green wall won him a prestigious award from the Society of Garden Designers. Fats ears and flying hydrate <laughs> shrubs in the sky. Shrubs which is in the great. sky, absolutely. And it's freestanding, is it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's double sided. That's correct. Yeah, a wall of green madness, basically. <laughs> uh, how old is this wall then? Uh, this is about a year. The plants start to have a bit of maturity and do their thing, and they, they grow out and then they fall under gravity and they start to look for the light again. Yeah. So you get this strange sort of shape to the plants that you don't get when you just drop them into the ground. Yeah. What I like about it is the way it's so green and sort of imposing and tall, but it ties in beautifully with the, the extended landscapes or blurring the spaces. But I just love the way that you might have sort of like strappy leaves sort of growing through the bigger leaves of the hookerella and yeah. the way things grow up through each other. Pakistan's terminalis. Now, I everyone's know. so rude about that plant. A lot of garden designers, <laughs> friends of mine, are so rude about that plant. It's a very good plant, well, Pakistan. Look at the glossy green leaves. I like it. This freestanding wall has established and grown over the last 12 months. It's a great example of a living wall packed with plants, thriving in an urban setting. 
But 12 weeks ago, Adam embarked on another project, which is rapidly integrating itself into a small city garden. Wow, this is absolutely stunning, this one. It's beautiful, isn't it? Is it, it, it what, what's behind there? Just a concrete wall or something? Yeah, just a, a concrete block wall. Yeah. yeah. And from a design point of view, you've managed to completely free up this space as an entertaining area, but still get the volume of plants and variety of plants into a garden. Do you, do you sit down with a piece of paper and think this is how the planting's going to go? Yeah, well, actually, uh, this is my fourth wall, and the first three, I was a bit freestyle and just went, You I made know, up as you I went know, along. Yeah, I know how to do it. But yeah. this one, I did draw a planting plant, and I think it has, it has benefited yeah. from that. But I, I do like some of the combinations. That Euphorbia martinia is one of my favourite euphorbias. This is the first time I've used the euphorbia, yeah. and it's been really successful. Yeah. Um, and I've also, just behind that, I've got the... Uh, Nigularia. Yeah. Um, which is the first time I've used them, and they're, being, yeah. they're doing really well. Yeah, they're um, lovely. And also, because you see the underside, like, like the mahogany underside of the leaf as you, as you get closer. I really like that. No, it's stunning. So, Adam, how have you actually made this wall, then? Well, there's two layers of fabric pinned onto uh, plastic backing, which is sits on a steel frame. Okay. Well, what is the fabric, as well? It's a, a moisture-retentive fleece. OK. So you've got two layers of that. Yeah. Yeah, and then you just cut holes in it, or...? Basically, the, you cut a slit in the, in the, in the top layer, yeah. open up a small pocket, take the plant and root it in, and then I staple gun the pocket closed with stainless steel staples and that holds it all in place. Oh, I see. Special compost or just normal? I put a bit of sort of like magic compost in there which has like sort of water retentive gels and there's some gold flakes in there and some food in there. Okay. And then obviously as, as the plant grows, the roots go down into the fabric and sort of really start to hold onto it. And it knits together? It all knits together. It becomes one giant kind of organic thing. Okay. Um, and watering? Water permeates down through the two layers and into the pockets and the idea is just to keep the pockets sort of moist. Now, you don't have to use that much water. You just want to keep it damp and the plant's perfectly happy. You know, they're becoming more and more popular, but do you think they've got a real future? I have to say, I would love to see it kind of take off because as our population grows and our pressure on cities grows, I think people are going to have less space to be in. And so the more they can use the sort of floor space for the children to run around and to, to entertain or to eat, then, you know, they can put their planting up onto the vertical surface. Um, which would otherwise be quite a dead space. So how achievable is a green wall in your own back garden? Well, Adam went down his own route of making something up, and you can do that, but there are many off-the-peg products that can help you do it too. For example, there's this plastic module, like that, which basically stack up on top of each other or you can fix them to the wall and they are a reservoir which will hold the water in there and then you plant through these gaps and the plants spill out and they spill over and they green it all up over time. Then there's this, which is just a small hanging section of pockets and that'll work really well for herbs or some smaller plants. It wouldn't be able to take a great deal of weight but that might just be perfect for you at home. Or you can go down something like this, which is, it's a bigger system, it's a little bit more adventurous. A section of this, five pockets, will set you back about 130 quid. But it's a good investment because it'll last you 10 to 15 years. And this system is made using really quite chunky, thick fabric. It's plastic lined at the back, and then there's plastic underneath here as well. So it's really holding the moisture in here, but holding the moisture off the wall too. So ideally, get some small plants, plant them in compost, and let them knit together over time, and it takes on a life of its own. And also, it's not like hanging baskets or window boxes, which you might plant up seasonally. This is there all year round, so you're gonna garden it all year round too. You're gonna cut back perennials, you're gonna deadhead plants, and you've also got to weed and feed it as well. Our watering is the key thing about these walls. You've gotta keep them nice and moist, or they'll dry out very, very quickly. This one's got a slot running all the way through for a perforated hose that you can just loop it through and keep the wall nice and moist and you've got to think also about feeding and you could run some feed through that pipe so it could feed the plants over time or you could go for a foliar feed just mix up some foliar feed and spray it say once a month keep the plants again really nice and healthy but these green walls can be a fantastic solution. If you're limited for space or looking out onto a dull brick wall, then this is a way to get your green fix.
I just love the plant crash. This is where everybody comes with their booty to store it away while they dash off and buy miles more plants. And one of the best things about it is that you can get the whole sort of feel of the show. You know what people are really interested in. And as these plants go past, it's such a temptation to look into those bags and think about how they could propagate the plants and make masses more. What a lovely load of grasses, aren't they beautiful? Such texture. Do you think we can split them at this time of year to make more? Because they're all in flower at the moment, it's not a great time to split them. But the best time to split grasses is the spring. But also, most of those are species, so they're going to grow true from seed. But if you've got a grass like this one, this is a little discampsia called tetragold, and it's just perfect for being divided right now. But you need a bit of bicep power here, so <laughs> just tear it apart. It's very satisfying, <laughs> especially if you've had a hard day. <laughs> Every little piece that you can extract that's got a little tiny bit of root is going to make a new plant. Make a hole, I'll lower them in gently, firm them in, and that's it, you've got brand new grass. How quickly do the grasses grow? Probably by this time next year you should have a clump oh, that, nice. that big. I think you've got enough grasses there, yes. you? <laughs> <laughs> well, Pat, you grew these for the first time last year, is that right? I did. I purchased one last year and it did so well I decided to treat myself to those today. One of the most exciting things about Streptocarpus is actually propagating them. Take a, a fully developed leaf yep. and you just cut carefully into the base and then I'm just going to slice it. And you've got to keep them the right way up. So the bit that was at the end that was attached to the plant is always the base of the cutting. Oh, I see. Right? Yes. Otherwise they'll be upside down. And all you do is push them gently into that trench. Come and do one, come on. That's it. One lot of water right over the top when you've finished. Yes. And then if you've got a heated propagator, that's great. But just a kitchen windowsill is fine. What will happen is that every time a vein hits this bottom cut surface, yes. you'll get a new little plant. Just detach them very carefully and pop them up individually. One leaf will give you what? 20 plants. All oh, right. You'll be back here next year selling them. Plant. I'll need more window sales. You will. This year the RHS are running a new show garden competition here at Gardeners World Live, open to both keen gardeners and established garden designers. Fellow <coughs> Chelsea gold medal winning garden designer and my old mate Andy Sturgeon was at the helm. We caught up with him yesterday. When the designers were brought here to the NEC, they were given the same palette of materials to choose from, the same timber, the same stone, and then they could buy additional plants, making a total budget for each garden of only £8,000. And it really is incredible to see what each of those designers has done, because the results are absolutely fantastic. There are some great design techniques used in these gardens. This one, for example, has put the whole design on a diagonal within the rectangular plot. Now, that creates a nice flow and movement to the space, but that also creates these triangular planting beds around the main area, which again creates some more interest and a bit of flow to it. Or to bring the whole design into 3D, keep that spiralling theme going, but break the garden up at eye level, which is really important. What's really interesting is the designers have had all the same materials, but the way they use them is so different. Garden design is about stamping your personality onto your plot. There's no question that the thing about show gardens is you don't have to like them all, but you invariably find something 
that you can take back home and apply to your own garden. Now, talking about your own gardens at home, here are some jobs to be getting on with this weekend. It is important to keep seedlings moving from the moment they're ready to prick out to the moment they're planted out in the garden. This is a tray of wallflower seedlings. Now, they were just sown about a week ago, and you can see they've germinated nicely, but there as yet, there are no true leaves. In other words, all the foliage comes from the seed itself rather than from roots. And this isn't ready for pricking out. However, a tray of wallflowers, identical seed, which was sown two weeks earlier, now these are perfectly ready. And you can see that they look quite different because they've got, in effect, the adult leaves. And that means that they're growing off roots. And if you've got roots, you can move it. So what you get are plants growing in plugs. But they have to be potted on at the right moment. It's quite critical that you don't leave them in too long or try and plant them out too soon. Now, here are some zinnias, which are growing nicely, but they're not ready to be planted out. And if I take one out of its plug, you can see two things have happened. One, it's broken off because the roots haven't reached the bottom of the compost, so therefore there's nothing to hold it together. So that wants to go back into its plug and be kept either in a cold frame or somewhere protected. Here I've got some yarrow, and this is looking fantastic. Now to me, this is 100% ready, and if I take it out, nice root system. The roots are growing right down to the bottom. They're not outgrowing their goodness. The plant looks healthy. That's ready for going out. It'll do for another week or so, but after that, it'll start to get root-bound and exhaust its goodness, which is exactly what's happened with this basil here. You can see the roots are matted, and if you compare it with one of these, you can see many more roots. They're struggling against the edge of the plug. It'll grow. It's not wasted, but it'll never grow as well as that will if it's planted out. So timing is important. So, I would say that if you're growing plants from seed, and it's always a good idea to do that, the major thing is to keep them moving on. Wait till they're ready, and then when they are ready, move them on or plant them out. There is an awful lot to see here. From a floor marquee that is crammed full of lovely plants to an array of garden gadgets and gizmo that's going to satisfy any gardening whim. But you can't take everything home. You have to choose your favourites. And here are ours at Gardener's World Life this year. You've got to be really eagle-eyed at this show, and I've spotted these brilliant plant supports made of rusted wire with that curled top. I think they look very good, and they're very practical, so that if you've forgotten to stake early on, you just push one in alongside your delphinium or verbascum and just twirl it round, and it holds it steady. Very simple, looks good, brilliant. It's impossible to choose a favourite plant, but I could drool all day over this anemone narcissiflora. It's a woodlander, it loves cool, damp conditions, and its flowers are a delight. Pure white on the inside, shaded with blue and purple on the back, with green centres and blue anthers. Who could ask for anything more? This is my favourite thing, I really want one. It's a charcoal maker. Take the lid off. Put in some twigs or some branches. Lid goes back on again. Onto the fire, and after a couple of hours, all the moisture has been taken out, and you're left with the best charcoal for drawing or for barbecue. It's irresistible. If you had asked me before I came to the show whether I would choose a Xantodestia as my favourite thing in the show, I could have guaranteed I would have said no, almost certainly not. But there's something about this that keeps drawing me back, and I want it. I want to go home with this plant. It's partly the intensity of the colour, and partly because now we've got the pond, I think it would work in a way that it wouldn't have fitted into the garden before. The colour's right, the shape is right, and also I've seen them growing in the wild, in ditches, in the mountains in South Africa, where they get filled with water for weeks and then bone dry for weeks, and it's that difference between extreme wet and extreme dry which they like and which I can give them in the area around the pond. So, it's not as though I've chosen it, I think it's chosen me, and I'd better take it home. 
Right, thanks for the first one. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot. Thank bye you. bye. Now these Zantadeshias like some sunshine, so the shady side of the living wall is probably not ideal. But I see that you have brought along some fabulous plants, and it's beginning to look really good. Obviously, hostas, flourishia, see, Alcamilla morris has been brought in. That will cope, actually, with sun or shade. Very, very adaptable. Ferns are ideal. We've got a batch here with a note attached. I need my glasses, really, but it says, it's from Alan Smith in Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, small garden, but packing a lot, so I've plenty to spare. Well, that's really good. And we can put, we've got some ivy here, we've got some hookahs there. You see, if I put that in that spot there, immediately that looks good because the ivy falls down and any plant that will hang down a wall often looks just as good as a plant growing up a wall. Now, the show is open all weekend, right up until Sunday night, so do come along. Most of it's undercover, actually, so it doesn't matter what the weather is. There's masses to see. And you'll also have a chance to see Carol, Joe, and myself, because Carol and I are here all weekend, and Joe's here tomorrow. And we'll each be doing a turn here at the Living Wall. So bring along your plants, meet us, chat to us, and we can help you position them in exactly the best place. And I'll see you at Longmeadow next Friday at the normal time. So, bye-bye. Tracking the devastation left by the plague in the 14th century, the great British story of people's history is next on BBC Two. Over on BBC Four now, what happened to the music after 1978? Find out with Punk Britannia.